My name is Andreas Draschitz. I'm a fellow and research uh, physician in Matthias Zinovcic's group here in Tübingen. And together with our today's speaker, we've worked quite a lot uh, on clinical outcomes assessment, and I'm happy to be your host today. Um, what can you expect of uh, today's um, format? Um, the AGI Tools and Methods Studio was uh, is, is a novel format. We're trying this the first time with the first session, and it's important to, to know that this is supposed to be a work studio. Um, it's, not a, it's not a series of polished presentations where you can just sit and, and, and listen. It's really it's supposed to be an interactive format where we discuss and improve uh, trial readiness tools and methods. So it's not about results, it's about methods, work in progress with regard to their novel or improved application in the ataxia field. For example, as today's session on clinical outcomes assessment and modeling, of clinical outcomes assessments in natural history studies and for trials. Important, you see the, the picture of this uh, car garage uh, up there. It's really a hands-on um, format with the possibility and the mandate to debate, to develop, to argue, to and then finally to tackle really time and hard to crack qu research questions in ataxia trial readiness. And as Mattis has put it last week, it's really about getting your hands dirty no polished data, really interaction, work in progress. And there is not even a distinct limit for, for the number of presentations in a given session or a number of studios. It's really, we do whatever is needed to complete the task to resolve this hard to crack question. Important if you're here today to just watch and to expect nice results, this is not what you are going to get today. It's really an invitation and even a mandate to join this discussion and, and to, 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 um, to make further progress in these difficult um, questions that we're dealing with. Um, today's meeting will be like every other meeting. We have one hour, um, more or less sharp, with um, a share of 20 minutes um, for the input talk, uh, and then the most part, 40 minutes for discussion. Um, the audience, you, um, could be everyone across the Ataxia Global Initiative, and uh, you are happy to invite everybody who is interested. And um, importantly, um, this is the first suggestion for a session, but it's important to realize and to remember this can be triggered by any AGI working group or individual AGI member. Whenever you have uh, this one of these hard to crack questions, feel free to suggest uh, such a such a method studio, such a session, and, and we see whether we can realize it. So please submit any topic suggestions that are burning um, under your nails, um, so to speak. The organization of this uh, uh, format is run by the AGI office, so this would be uh, the place to, to contact. Um, this is the first session you're joining today. It's the second studio of the first session. Um, last week, um, and as a next session, um, we're already considering to um, discuss and to work on the um, optimization of clinical outcomes assessment in ataxia with uh, respect to patient meaningfulness. Uh, Mathis Zinovcic and Rebecca Schüle are, are happy to host this next session, but again, we are um, inviting everybody to propose even more sessions like this. Um, as a brief recap and to, to give us a framework for today's talk, I would like to um, recap Chris Rumi's session from last week. He's also joining today. At least I, can, I saw his face a second ago. Um, I won't go in every detail. It was a very broad discussion at the end. And if you want to have a look at the complete session, please uh, go to YouTube. Um, you can find the video there and really go through the discussion uh, that we had last week. In brief, um, Chris, as far as I understood, it was a very intense discussion, um, dichotomized the, the topic to make it more digestible. We had on the one side, we had um, the concept of slope models to analyze um, longitudinal data, where he made clear that this is a domain of natural history studies and that slope models are a characterization of long-term behavior of clinical outcomes assessment, which are helpful to, to identify long-term predictors, ultimately aiming to reduce variance in the models for, for better prediction. On the other hand, um, Chris uh, introduced the change models um, where he emphasized that this is the domain of clinical trials. They're aiming for short-term responses in clinical trial contexts, usually below two years. 
And as a specific um, analytical approach, he suggested the mixed model for repeated me measures as a standard approach to um, analyze this type of model. There's one sentence that I kept in mind from this session. It was, if the shape of the curve works against you. We had um, quite impressive examples um, how um, nonlinear shapes of response curves in, in longitudinal data can be difficult to handle in models. Um, um, this unpredictable response curve can be a biological treatment effect. It can be due to placebo effects. It can be an achievement of a milestones like less of emulation, which leads to a different um, trajectory. This is what we heard last time. So today's speaker, I'm happy to introduce Ralf-Dieter Hilgers. He's uh, chair of the Department of Medical Statistics at the University of Aachen. And he will build on what on this dichotomization that, that, um, that Chris has presented last time. We have this concept or this context of natural history study and the context of clinical trial. And what he's going to do today is he will have a stronger focus on the context of natural history studies and what linear mixed effect models, so essentially slope models, are able to do, what advantages they have, but also what potentially implicit assumptions we might have to consider when we use such type of models in our natural history studies. And he will also address um, what these models can do in clinical trials, and he's a bit more skeptical on change models in this context. And he will propose an ANCOBA analysis and give us more information how to use these models in this clinical trial context. With this, I would like to invite all of us to get our hands dirty again. And I hand over to Ralf Dieter. Okay, thank you very much. I have to share my screen. Um, here we go. So can everybody hear me and see me shaking and as well uh, see my screen right now? I hope, because we checked before. So anyway, um, well, it's an honor for me to uh, present my thinking and uh, let's, let's say some, some sort of journey, which I have in several discussions with several neurologists around the world, uh, modeling uh, clinical trial data. As uh, Andreas already said, um, I will start with the, uh, with the natural history course of data, because I think that is the basic ground uh, which we are uh, coming from. And um, I, I present you something which I, which I learned in the discussion and uh, which we, we, we can use and in particular the, the assumptions. And then I go over to the clinical trial modeling. But I start with uh, some provocative main thesis which I have uh, and which I would like to prove during the discussion in the following. So, um, as I said, main thesis is a starting point, then I will discuss natural history study, key challenges, um, assumptions when you do something, uh, then I will go over to the clinical trials modeling and then we'll summarize. So, my provocative um, key messages um, are, let's say, start with change to baseline is less suitable to analyze natural history co cohort study. And I, I'm thinking about cohort study. So you have longitudinal data from some patients and we'll try to analyze this. So analyzing linear or other functional trend in disease progression is one of the main, um, main objectives of um, natural history cohort study, uh, which I found in the discussion. Um, natural history studies can, to a certain extent, and that is my experience, inform about planning of comparative conformatory trials, so randomized clinical trials, or whatever you would like to have. Uh, in particular, with respect to the outcome. Um, and then some warnings, which I would like to bring on the table. Change to baseline analysis ignores core variables. You have to modify or extend the model by this then it can be good, but it has some uh, several assumptions which have to take into account and change to baseline is less suitable to plan and analyze confirmatory trials. 
So my basic is from Rosemary Bailey. Uh, she's from Imperial College, a co-worker of mine, and she's now in St. Andrews, Scotland. And uh, she said always to me, the design implies the analysis. So that's why I'm starting from the study type and from the objective and then go to the analysis and not the other way around. So let's go ahead. So, well, what I understand in natural history cohort study is that we have to, let's say, analyze this data. And you see a typical example on the right uh, above with some, let's say, uh, data points from patients uh, where we would like to understand what is going on in these patients. And I don't think that you, uh, you would like to start with, uh, make a comparison at, let's say, any time point, any visit point. Uh, you would like to, to model or see a trend or something like that in, in these data points. And that is my number four, the green marked thing. I think that progression modeling, progression modeling uh, by annual change is a typical question which is posed after uh, having the data uh, from um, a natural history cohort. That's a typical question. Uh, I make in brackets a linear because sometimes you can go one step further, quadratic trends or other trends which can be modeled as well. Um, but, um, well, when we thinking about uh, doing some analysis, we start with the simplest one and then go one step further. Okay, um, that's the basic point, the objective. And now let's go uh, more into detail and think about what are the challenges of this typical figure we see on the right side. So um, my next transparency, um, the figure is again repeated and uh, you can see exactly what is going on in this data. And I, 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 I recall some terms which we used in biostatistics um, to, to describe what is the problem here. We start with the left sensor. So not every patient started in the same age and the same age of onset with data gathering. So we have very heterogeneous patients. Here on the x-axis, you see the age of the patient. So that is completely different. We have left centering. So you pick up a patient at different stages of the disease. The right centering is also very typical in natural history cause study because uh, you do not have the same prolongation of, uh, of the visits and uh, the, uh, the visit time. The third one is also very typical. Uh, there is a random variable which is underlying your observation. And this, is, this random variable is the time. So the visit is more a random variable, then it is a fixed time point where you have the visit. So this is also my experience from the AFRAX register. And four, I come later on because that's a little bit tricky um, because you have scores you would like to evaluate. They have their own problems. And uh, then the functional form, is it linear or is it not linear? You see here this frog type. Uh, well, we might hesitate to consider this as a linear shape, but I mean, well, if you don't have anything else um, at the end right now, probably you will go for a linear trend and hope that this, uh, this course will continue in this, in this way. So um, what, is, uh, what is the method concerning left center? So typically what people do is they shift the patient to a certain point zero here and say, okay, every patient started with visit zero and I, I'm looking to the, uh, to the course of the trial. So, um, well, um, you have to take into account that this has some assumptions. The first assumption is that the, time, that the, uh, that the course of the patient's um, score is completely the same before and after. So let's make it simple. Say patients having a linear, uh, linear trend and you shift that and say, okay, they 
I pick them at a particular point, and then they have a linear trait. So this ignores covariables, which are in typically the baseline score at that point. But uh, that can be included in the model as well, no doubt, but uh, that is typically done. So to bring the covariable topic uh, a little bit more to on the table, that not only um, has some implication to the age of onset or something like that, that also has something to do with the shape of the progression which the patients have. So let's think about some patients having score, SARA scores below five. Then you see some nicely, smoothly linear trend in the data. I'm not saying that the, that the cause is, lin is a linear function. There's a linear trend in it and it decreases. So it makes sense to, to make some, uh, some ideas about difference between the baseline value and the three, um, uh, three months or three years. visit. But that differs completely if you have patients with a SARA score in the upper area, so above 35 SARA point, you see, well, they cannot increase anymore. So that's a big problem in the modeling and in, the, uh, in, in any kind of statistical analysis. So change of baseline depends on the covariable, in that way, the SARA score, and we have a baseline dependent slope. So we model that typically with interaction. Yeah, um, that's not always done, but anyway, you have to take that into account and consider it. So best you have, if you think about clinical trials, best you have patients in the middle, or let's say, so from five to 20, then it's nice because then you have uh, linear slopes in the day. So um, the next point, what is done after the uh, uniform uh, zero point in the visit time, um, patients, uh, uh, some researchers feel very uncomfortable with this heterogeneous um, observational time. So this random very, um, observational time the patients have. So what they are now doing is squeezing time points. I have this discussion frequently. Yeah. So they, as you can see for the time point two, you have only two observations which exactly fit to this curve. So that's a pity. So then they start defining intervals so that, uh, and to call this interval two. And the time frame, the time range will be called the two year visit. And they collect all the information to that. Well, you can do that, but you have some assumptions to do. The first one is you need a constant effect on the time interval. And second is you have to have a monotone effect over the whole time. If you assume that, which might be questionable in this scenario here, then you cannot do it. So um, what we have here is a problem with the definition of these time intervals. And um, they might to a certain extent uh, overlap, but that is a very problematic thing. And you impute in your analysis directly the problem of missing observations, unless you go the way for linear interpolation, which needs the constant or the monotone effect over time period as such. Okay, let's go ahead uh, this way and go in the direction to fit a change uh, model to the data in natural history. Stuff. So let's take in mind we have the squeezed time and we have this, uh, this sort of interval which are collapsed. So Probably, um, well, what we all know in statistics is that change uh, model um, increase the variab variability and decrease the power. So you need much more observations. And that is in particular true if the correlation in a two arm parallel uh, compared to a two arm parallel group design is, oh, there's a small uh, problem here, must be less than a half. If the correlation between the baseline value and the uh, value under consideration after a certain time point 
uh, if this correlation is less than half, then a parallel group design ignoring the baseline value has much more power. And it is also true that there is another, uh, another approach, which um, also in, um, is, is better than this change model, uh, which I come, uh, in, uh, to which I come in a minute. So uh, under which, assu which assumptions do we have here? So individual covariables, e.g. baseline uh, values are uninformative if you ignore them in the analysis and baseline values are comparable. Then you can go in this direction and do the um, change analysis model um, here. So now I come to a little bit more sophisticated model, uh, meaning that I include in the change model a variable, the baseline value. So that might be, um, might be a better idea because you account for or just for uh, the baseline values. So with this approach, you decrease the variability, you increase the power, so less observations at the end, and it diffracts different form of changes. But now rest some minute. What it is typically is if you take this model, this um, ANCOVA model um, here, and you just put beta equal to one, right? And then you put the baseline characteristic on the other side. Well, you have the change model we just discussed. So the change model is a special case of the ANCOVA model, but we know the ANCOVA model is more powerful. So that's a nice story. But now, bad news. The bad news is, that the ANCOVA model assumes something. And that is in particular a problem if you are going to a clinical trial. Let's go to a clinical trial and you have two treatment groups. The ANCOVA model assumes that the problem is uh, that the relation between the baseline value and the value you are interested in is the same in both groups. If you have a different slope between baseline value and the value there, depending on the treatment groups, then the ANCOVA model is bad. But this circumstance also belongs to the, uh, to the change model, but it is hidden there. Nobody takes care of that because the change model is a special case of the ANCOVA model. And that is typically not in progression models we, we do in, in uh, we modeled in the in the um, Friedrich Ataxi context. Okay, let's go ahead. So um, here in this change trend model, we assume um, let's say random effects of the of the intercept, random effect of the slope, and we can model curvatures like that one here, and you might be discomfortable with the, with the progression rates. Yes, I know, I'm also discomfortable, but if I don't have any other methods, it's fine with me for the moment to, to describe progression. What I, what I have as assumptions is that every patient progresses linearly in the trend. Not the values are exactly linear, following a linear um, line, but the trend in the data is more or less linear. But now I come to the distribution assumption, which is rather tricky. And that is a big problem, was a big problem when I analyzed the effects data uh, last time with Katrin. So um, we, can in, uh, we can put other models in it, and I come to this in a minute. So I show you the problem. So this is my data for the effects data for the two here. And I copied that from the, uh, from the paper with Katrin. With Katrin here. So fairly linear, this trend for the SARS score. And you see that we go not beyond the 30. So that's really typical for these patients. But then we have the four year data, that one here. And you see now the data points. And what you can see is that the 40, the upper limit of the, of the score is attached by, by a lot of patients. And some could not move. It's very rarely that they go, go back again. So we analyzed how many of them are on the, on the top 
of the 40 uh, score. So, um, well, we have around one or two percent. So even here we see in the whole group a fairly linear trend, but the risk of uh, what we statisticians call a truncated distribution. So the, tr the distribution is not normal, it's cut it on the top and on the bottom. So, and our analysis shows like what is also done in simulation of studies show that if the number of patients in the data set, which show high scores or low scores, I think you call that flawed or sealed effect. If the number or the percentage is rather higher than 20%, then you should care about that. Then the traditional linear mixed effects models do not work, but you can go to the non-linear mixed effects models, which can model this truncated distribution. So we can solve this problem again. So that's nice. And the output is similar to what you have in the linear mixed effects model. So what you have seen up to now is that all the standard approaches um, have some implicit assumptions. And it is good to take these assumptions into account and discuss with these assumptions. These are statistical assumptions which we put in the data and which also might influence the interpretation. Wait a minute. Um, let's go for four slides to the um, to the clinical trust. Complete from my point of view, completely different story. Clinical trials are completely different to natural history courts. You cannot compare this. Well, what we all wish is that we learn so many things about uh, in the natural history course so that we can plan the clinical trial, but be careful, know exactly what you are doing. So um, natural history courts have potential as a end point progression or whatever you want. Natural com, uh, confirmatory trials have a specified endpoint, and you have to, to stick on that. And the whole validity of your trial is based on that. So be careful in choosing. And well, so we don't have left sensing, we don't have right sensing, we have because we plan and we the visits and so on. We don't have unscheduled visits, so that is all best, but that has some consequences. The distributional assumptions. It's the same in both groups, unless you go to a range where the solid score behaves nicely. Um, the functional form of the course should be considered. We have other problems like um, similarity of groups, stratification you might have in mind, repeated uh, observations. Are they there or are they missing? We have multi-component scales, which I don't attach at that, at that point, and I don't attach the problem of, of fine examples, which needs a completely different view on the analysis. So what methods do we have to overcome these problems in randomized clinical trials or clinical trials? So scheduled visit causes the problem of missing data, but we have the, um, well, let's say estimation method as well as MI is for multiple imputation techniques, which can be used um, to, you, uh, to put valid assumptions. Don't follow these, um, this consideration in the literature of last observation carried forward. I mean, my best friend, uh, one of my best research friends, Holt Mohrenberg said, well, that stupid thing, that's a devil. Why? Well, Last observation carried forward assumes that the missing values are completely at random. That is a model which is never seen in medical science. Similarity, you might use stratification, you could put this covariable into the model. Repeated observation, multiple testing. Wow, cool. Define a decision rule. Don't go for one for only. That's the best rule you can do. There are very completely nice procedures where you don't have to adjust, in particular if you have time codes. I don't tell you uh, about this in this because I have only 20 months. Multi-component uh, scales, item response analysis, Mattis know this, which is uh, under consideration by uh, Mats, uh, Mats Carlson and our innovation project, and small samples. Well, a lot of people um, recommend to say, okay, we do Bayesian analysis. Well, if you have 20 people affected, 
let's let's talk about where is your prior prior knowledge is coming from. I don't know. Anyway, um, we have other suggestions. So my my main story is change from baseline analysis can be done even in an NMRM model context, but do it the right way. Include the baseline way. And this approach, if you are thinking about sample size consideration, is only in this situation more powerful if you have a different covariance structure, meaning the variance of the observations in the one group differ from the variance of the observation in the other group. I mean, if you have that, I would immediately ask, please tell me, how different is the variance? Because otherwise I couldn't plan. If you assume that the variance is equal, the uh, formulation with the baseline as a covariance is more powerful. But take into account the slope must be between the pre and po uh, uh, post uh, measurement uh, must be equal. Oh, there is a, a one, which is a fourth. And uh, so you have a common slope in the subgroup. Then it works and everything is fine and it is more powerful than to come to the end. Anyway, so I, I sum up. So I told you and I marked a line between them. Natural history codes data can be modeled by progression model based on linear trend or other trends. But you have to do some assumptions on the same time cons, linear or monotone trend, and the distributional assumptions has to be taken into account very explicitly. We do that in the effect semester. Different uh, slopes and uh, what the, the main is to show the different slopes of progression of the patients in my population. On the other hand, confirmatory trial. Maybe you have learned something in the natural history course. But the, um, the confirmatory trial has the problem with missing data. You have to formulate, if you do um, uh, multiple testing in particular, uh, even on linear contrast on the MMRM model, you have to uh, define a decision rule, uh, which is sound uh, to control the family-wise error rate. And the ANCOVA model adjustment for baseline improves about uh, uh, upon all other um, uh, models, but assumes a common slope and a common variance. So I'm very sorry. I mean, I know every time when everybody asked me, they would like to have one size fits all. And I go to a grocery store and would like to have that as well, but it isn't. Unfortunately, not. if you would like to model your data, there is no one size fits all. You have to look in the data carefully and see how the score behaves. I was very happy with the SARA score because it, it shows such linear uh, trends, even for individual patients. I was very satisfied with it. But other indices might not be in that way. So, um, well, um, and I would like to move give a small warning error. It is not intuitive to rewrite a sample size results and endpoint variable formulation from natural history cost data to a randomized clinical trials. We do something in our effects paper, but that was a wish of Katri, so that, he has a, that she has another, let's say, uh, an, another marker to see the differences. But uh, I, every time uh, we talk, I told her, don't use that for planning a clinical trial. And with that, um, thank you very much for your attention. And um, I'm happy to looking forward for the discussion. Well, thanks a lot, Dieter. This was an exciting talk. And I think you touched a lot of points that we can relate to what we've heard last week from Christian. Some things seem to converge, others might create some dissonance where we don't know where we are at the moment. Um, so with this uh, last slide, I would like to open the discussion. So are there any questions? Yeah, maybe I'll go for uh, Gil Atai from Biohaven. Uh, yeah, excellent uh, presentation. I think one of the, you know, when you when you put up some of the earlier slides, particularly when you're looking at the when you're looking at the Sarah score ranges like five and then above 35, where you have essentially a flat 
curve, right? It's flat in early in, you know, when the SARA scores are low, and then it's flat at the high end when the SARA scores are severely high. But as you pointed out in your latest slide, the, the most responsive region is in the middle, right? The above five and the less than 35. Now, and so therefore the way I look at this and, and my sense with regard to the distribution of SARA scores, and some of that experience is weighted by clinical trial observation and some of it's weighted by natural history, but it's that it's more, it's almost like a sigmoidal relationship, right? Where you've got very little change at the beginning and little change at the other end. And, and the band for the buck is in the middle where you have a very responsive population, lin a linear really uh, change going up and down, which that's where you want to provide an intervention that might slow disease progression or uh, re not reverse disease progression, but really alter the trajectory of these disease progression in the middle. The, the challenge has been in trial enrollment, I think is to really the covariates that identify where the patients are at, and you know, like a SARA score, a low SARA score, obviously, is you know, could be one position. A high SARA score, you could have criteria that excludes at the extremes, but there's still a lot of variability, right? And if you don't pick your patients in order to achieve that that uh, middle zone, that sweet zone, uh, you're going to get a lot of you're going to get non-responses at one end or the other, and I think. That is kind of the, you know, one of the practical challenges of developing uh, trend, you know, developing these kind of change from baseline analyses in clinical trials. Uh, achieving equipoise at the beginning of following, you know, making sure you have a homogeneous population that is responsive, that is progressing, but that your scales also are responsive to that change, that they really track with disease progression. So just... But I think this is a, you know, an excellent illustration of some of the challenges that, that we face uh, in designing clinical trials. Agree completely. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Jill. Um, well, I, I, um, you, you exactly um, um, marked the point. Um, I, I also, I, I not only mentioned that you have to look to the summer baseline score, uh, which should be in a certain range, and probably you can also stratify according to age of onset or something like that to do that. But I, but I also, I mean, that's also the next point, which I did not make uh, explicitly clear, is that you, you have to consider in which time period I should pick up the patients. So, um, so to see the, the, uh, the treatment effect, um, you cannot um, say if you, I mean, we have, I think we have um, at least six year uh, data from the EFACT register right now. And uh, you cannot, as nobody would make a clinical trial which prolongs six years, right? But it's good to see uh, that, how that the behavior over six years is similar to what you already see in the two year period. So it makes you more certain that if you consider some point uh, where you would like to, um, uh, to detect the difference between two treatments, um, that is uh, a right point. Uh, it would be worse if, 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 the, if the effect lost over the time. Yeah. So yeah. Um, and, and that can be learned by natural history cost data. Was that your point or? Did yeah, I... no, no, I think, the, you know, the, 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 a, a functional form that really can, can kind of be used to, you know, uh, anticipate the temporal trends in the placebo arm, obviously, which is, should be known, uh, should be informed by the, by the natural history data. And then, and then basically some, uh, you know, inference about what the treatment effect would be and how it might modify that, that temp temporal trend. I, we've tried, you know, one of the things you mentioned, age and onset of symptoms or time since onset of symptoms, very important predictor, but we're still not there yet because, again, uh, patients, uh, like if you think of spinal cerebellar ataxia, um, they, they tend to present at different time points. Uh, and they get to a point where the majority of, of of symptoms at presentation are gait related, right? Ambulatory symptoms, but there's a lot of stuff that happens early on. So that variable becomes really important to try to achieve a, an equitable population. Uh, it's not a simple, it's not like 
okay, you've got, you now have, you're now into clinically relevant SCA. Obviously you have the genotype, but there's a lot of noise in the, um, in the definition of, uh, you know, when you become symptomatic and uh, the devil's in those details. So that, I, I really believe that that has a lot to do with variants in, in follow-up in these trials because they're not, patients aren't all at the same starting point. And, and adjustment for that becomes problematic because those measures are not well-defined, so, yeah. yeah. So, thanks for this first Thank you. discussion. Any more comments or questions? Peter, you may just want a provocative question. You said there is not the one in all, one fits all solution, but at the very end, wouldn't most of the examples you were showing would work with the linear mixed effect model, wouldn't they? I mean, those your natural history data or the, the, the you, you suggested linear mixed effect model, several of the problems you highlighted for the clinical trial setting, you could tackle with the linear mixed effect model. So this seems not maybe not one fits all, but fits 80% of the problems it does solve. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mats, for uh, Mattis, for this uh, uh, for this provocative uh, question. <laughs> <laughs> it's like every time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Uh, to be a little bit more um, detailed, well, the, the uh, what we understand on um, with the term linear mixed effects models is a broad class of models which includes, let's say, the, starting from the t-test, going on ANOVA, going on ANCO, yeah. or including regression models, and including also the MRIM model. Uh, that's uh, that's all, only a formulation. So I, I call them all uh, um, linear mixed effects model. And my point is only uh, which variables do I have to consider uh, to make the right model? So that is based on the variance structure, that is based on the covariables, but you are completely right. So I think that this sort of models might be more, uh, more uh, very important. And to add some further aspects, I mean, uh, uh, I talked about uh, or argued against the SARA score. No, uh, I, I talked about the SARA score and the limited, um, uh, the limited range, right? Which problems do occur from that? And probably um, you can extend the linear mixed effects model by, by very small uh, parts uh, to come up to the Nonlinear mixed effects model. It's, it's not a miracle. It's not a a, a big story. So um, this is, let's say, a more broader class. But the context is the same. What we are doing uh, with the statistical analysis, and uh, that's uh, that's quite nice. And what I found is uh, in my in my analysis, and uh, probably I, I I talked about uh, that point to Andreas uh, yesterday. He thinks that in further analysis, we also have to consider uh, go more in the direction of the nonlinear mixed effects models, but uh, while the, the, the values of the SARA score approaching, uh, let's say the 40, uh, the 40. And so we have to go there and we have to check whether our linear mixed effects model do the same as the nonlinear mixed effects model. But that is easy done. I've done this in, in the advanced uh, terminology. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah. Uh, that was a long, uh, long version of the uh, of the words. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Peter. Chris, Chris, you unmuted yourself. I consider that <laughs> as the wish to <laughs> to comment. Very attentive moderator here. Um, yeah. Well, I, I don't really know. I, there's a, there's a, there's a lot of points that I've spoken to last week, but really, what what I think is most important is is this one. We need to put this in context of clinical relevance. And as you all know, I'm, or I've said many times before, I'm not a fan of non-linear modeling of things like the SARA score. Um, what I always argue is that a patient who is ambulant and a patient who is non-ambulant very obviously um, progresses at different rates in the SARA score. So why mix them together? They're clinically completely different patients. I know it's difficult to define the region where non-ambulatory starts, but the end of the discussion is completely clear. So we just need to find the right group, which is in essence, 
um, ambulatory patients, no one enrolls non-ambulatory patients in a, in a trial. No one has ever done, unless a trial where they looked at specific things that were not related to gait imbalance or symptoms, let's say. So if you look at the, the SARA scores that you have shown on the previous slide, if they all hit the ceiling, then there's no, why, what is the need for nonlinear modeling if simply your outcome, your clinical, your COA is not the right COA for this population? Why use a SARA score in patients that hit the ceiling in the SARA score? It's the wrong measure. That's my argument. It has, it, and it's been shown many times that there are better measures for this population. Like you can now discuss if the 9 0 practice is a relevant measure for, it, for this population, different discussion. But another example is the ADLs. They work much better, um, at least the FA ADL. Of course, there's different ADLs that I've, I'm not that experienced in. But the EFACTS natural history study has shown, and we have also shown it with the FA COM study, that once a patient is non ambulant, the ADLs are much more sensitive than the SARA score. So, why use a SARA score in a non ambulant population? To my I'm going to be provocative as well. It doesn't make any sense. Thanks. Should I respond to them? Please. Yeah. Okay. Um, we must be very careful uh, what we are talking about. If we are talking about the clinical trial, everything what happens after randomization is affected by the randomization, right? So if we stratify our collective, and I'm not sure whether you are talking about that, that the ambulatory status is measured before the randomization or after the randomization. If it's measured after the randomization, then it is completely senseless to do that in a statistical model as a covariable. A covariable must be a variable which is before, measured before randomization. So that's the one point. And I'm not advocating the nonlinear mixed effects model for the analysis of a trial. No, I didn't do that. I said that if the cause is approaching the upper part, we should do at least in a sensitivity analysis, the nonlinear mixed effects modeling compared to the linear mixed effects modeling. But you are completely right. I mean, it would be very stupid to start a clinical trial having a SARA score at the at outcome and all patients having a SARA score at baseline of 35. That doesn't make sense. Then you have the right uh, the wrong end, end point for it. But if you are uh, in the middle and you have, let's say, a, lot, a, a longer period and you are afraid that you have the sealed operation, then you should do the nonlinear mixed effects model uh, as a sensitivity analysis to see whether your your estimates are stable. That's that's the only thing. Mm. Maybe I can just jump in because this is you know this is a good discussion around the you know how again how to enroll patients um, who are ambulatory and therefore have room to progress in their disease and therefore an intervention might alter the trajectory of that progression. The challenge is. And I think, Christian, you, you know, and you're both touching on this, is that um, there's just a lot of variability. So I, I think if you were to, you know, maybe, maybe the solution is somehow a baseline assessment that's more intensive so that we can definitely say this patient is ambulatory. Number one, there's two components. One, this patient is ambulatory and has room to, to progress. The second question is how long will it take for that patient to progress? Sometimes the natural history data is informative, but if you don't have a response, a, a movement over time, tickling the placebo arm, you're not gonna demonstrate a, a treatment effect. That's the second challenge. And I do think, I think Christian touches on the point that there is, there is an issue where uh, ADLs, you know, measures of function and activities of daily living may be, become more important than the exam, the SARA examination in patients who are sort of ambiguous, you know, they are, somewhat moving into non uh, uh, an ambulatory status. And there's an ethical component to that because if you can assess patients by both function and ADL and exam, the SARA score, those three, you can enroll patients who might be benefit in a, in a broader sense because you wanna be able to provide an effective treatment for as many patients as possible. 
it, you know, it, 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 you don't want to necessarily limit to, it to patients who are uh, ambulatory with a long way to go. You, you want to be able to, to perhaps show benefit in patients who are less ambulatory, but the, the therapy might have an improvement on their, their activities of daily living and function. That's one of the challenges in the, in the dialogue with, with regulators to come up with these kinds of complex inclusion criteria and time course to their satisfaction to be able to demonstrate a treatment. Okay. Uh, let me add some point. Uh, in the discussion with, um, uh, with Katrin, uh, where we talked about the ADL, um, and this shows quite nice um, uh, progression over the, uh, the four year period. Uh, then we found out, okay, ADL could be measured uh, um, at home and you do not need to go to the clinic. And from my, from my point as biostatistician, I think, wow, great, because we are in the pandemic at that time. And everybody is thinking about disrupted trials, not, measure, not potent, uh, able to measure the endpoint. So that could be a, a help. Yeah. And that even has to be considered in, uh, in other scenarios. I'm a member of the randomization working group and we discussed several kinds of disrupted trials. Um, earthquake, uh, no, uh, thunderstorm, Katrina in New Orleans, uh, earthquakes and so on and so on. And they will appear in the future as well. So that might be also very important for a trial in a rare disease where you never know whether a patient could come back because there's a local um, uh, quarantine or whatever. Oh, great. We're considering lots of points beyond the, the pure statistical approach. Um, I would like to, maybe it's my, my inherent preference for harmony, but, but um, I, have, I was wondering, I mean, the most naive way, as I understood, is to, to, use a, to do a change analysis and not including the baseline score. And but Christian even himself pointed out last time, he didn't explicitly put it on the slide, but he took it just for granted because it, it has to be done. But even if I do that, um, is it still a, a simplification? We've talked about a, a flat floor effect, then it's like a sigmoidal curve. So the slope is increasing and then it's decreasing again for the SARA. So if I add um, a, a covariate, um, if I add the baseline as a covariate, can I, do I have enough, um, is, it, is, it, is it good enough to, to capture such, such non-linear curves? Do, do I assume so some linear trend, a monotonic trend, or, or can it even be a U-curve or something? So is, 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 is this sufficiently considered, or is leaving in the, the non-cut, non so the non-change non score, the full score, is this the best way to leave all the covariance in the model or in the data, sorry. That's a difficult question. Why? Well, uh, the ANCOVA model is the general form. The, time, uh, the change model is a special case of that. You can do also an ANCOVA with a change on the other side. That's possible, but you increase the variance. Probably not for the treatment effect, but the total variance in your data. I don't know what, what effects this has when considering covariates. I didn't study that right now. But let this note, and uh, it's true for sure. So, um, but the assumption underlying a covariance analysis is because the um, change analysis is a special case of this, is also true for the change analysis. So, my question would be, if I consider, let's say we make, uh, we make a, 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 a change. Yeah, you as clinicians understand that better than me. Um, we consider uh, Friedrich ataxy uh, patients with treatment A and treatment B two years after, and you found a difference. And you go to the regulator, and I know exactly what they say. Well, we need to understand what the treatment effect is, how, behave, how it behaves over the course. So you have to present other material as well. So, and the, 
The difference model is, because it's a special case of the Ankoba model, there is an underlying assumption that the relationship between the baseline value and the point after, uh, uh, in the course of the trial is linear. You didn't see this anymore, but it is like this. And usually you can find that only if you include the, um, the interaction term of the treatment times the covariable, but because then the model shows you what is the linear trend in the one group and what is the linear trend in the other group. And if that is equal, then you are fine, then you're on, a, on the right side. It's like in a, in a multi-center trial. You go in a multi-center trial and what you are assuming, the treatment effect is the same in every center. And afterwards you have to check for this, the regulator will ask that. And if it isn't, Oh, you have big problems with acceptance of your multi-center trial. So similar problem with the slope underlying in the Ankova model. And I don't have this if I go directly to the slope model where I model the slope because here I allow that the slope in the one group is different from the slope in the other group. That's my endpoint. But for sure, it's a different endpoint than going to one time point and saying, okay, the mean effect in the SARA score after two years differs from the mean effect in the SARA score in the other. If you go to that. That's um, Chris? I think I think you described it quite nicely. Um, it doesn't really take care of the sigmoidal shape. If you want to cover the sigmoidal shape, you need the interaction that Rafita just explained and this interaction you usually avoid in pivotal trials because you don't want to have the discussion if on for on one end of your patient group and on the other end of your patient group a point difference has a different meaning then i, I don't want to have this discussion with your authorities so what yes. you should focus on is a is a linear decline and you need to limit your population on the left and on the right that's why we use a baseline score that we usually require and i would I don't know what this is for the Sarah, probably eight or nine, maybe a little lower. For the MFAS, we use 20. And then we need an upper limit, which in the ataxia trials that I have seen, at least in, in Friedrich, is um, usually ambulation. In, in the MOXIE trial, it was the exercise test. Although they gave an upper limit of 80, that's a limit that no one reached because someone who could do the exercise test with a maximum probably of something like 60 or so. So you, but you need an upper limit, and that's what it is. That's exactly that. Thanks. Because you want to avoid this interaction term mm -hmm. that really will get you into completely different discussions. I mean, you're absolutely right. Change at the at the high end of the sigmoidal function and change at the low end of the sigmoidal function is different from change in the middle where the action is, and that's a very complex discussion with the regulator. What what constitutes a treatment effect across that entire distribution of patients? Uh, and the other, the other thing too that I, yeah, I think also, you know, uh, all of us are talking about is the, the challenge with these exams is the variability will kill you. And, and uh, you know, Rob, you were talking about um, the uh, COVID having an effect on, on patients reporting for exams, right? Going to sites to have an exam. And maybe an ADL with devices might be a better way to go because they can, one can assess this at home. That kind of anything that contributes to the variance really, it, it, particularly for mixed model repeated measures, to show a mean difference over time, when you have a high variance like that, it just it's just a killer. Uh, and I think uh, even you know the, some of the preliminary results that we had from the Scott trial, which we discussed in the press release, you had basically you know effects that were compelling, that would be regarded as compelling on the SARA score, particularly we'll be using a modified SARA that uh, was uh, limited to uh, the, uh, the axial items. So the total score changes were, were, were smaller, but um, e even with those compelling, you could say the Delta was clinically relevant, but the variance was so high that it was not statistically significant. And that's where you really run into a brick wall sometimes with the regulators because they tend to uh, use that particular metric as you know the 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 you know the the, the final 
you know, a positive trial has a P less than 0.05, a negative trial. That, that's simplistic and it's not always the case, but they are very much wedded to p-values. And variance, as you well know, p-values are very sensitive to the effect, right? The sample size, but they're extremely sensitive to a very a, ver a highly variant effect where you can have a strong treatment effect, but if, if it's too variant, the p-value drops, uh, you know, the p-value goes above 0.05. Those are the, the challenges that we face really in demonstrating that a treatment effect. I think modeling is the way to go. Linear modeling is ideal, but your data must conform to that linear temporal trend. And it must be tight in the sense of, you know, you, your, your assessments must have uh, optimal variability. Okay. Okay, great. That's, that's, that also sums up the last thread of our discussion as it's there is some agreement, agreement there. And in the interest of time, we've already spent the, the full hour. I'd like to give a, a brief preview on, on Sophie Tezenas talk next week. We've touched um, um, some of the issues that she's going to talk about next week. We have at some point mentioned, well, what's at the sub item level? Um, um, and um, what about um, assumptions on linearity? Um, so Vita Zana will, uh, next session, she will talk about disease cause mapping as an approach to look at the Sarah score in an ordinal fashion and also providing the idea of adding other uh, outcome measures in, in a multi-site setting. So if you are interested and keen on discussing that further, I'm inviting you to join next week at this time. Um, and if you have uh, any further questions or comments, please just write them down and, and ask them again at the next session. And Mathis and I will have to come up with an, with an idea and a format to, to, to appreciate this ongoing discussion and to have it end artificially after a, a, third, a third studio of this first session. As I said last time, it will take as long as it takes. So with this, thanks again for your contributions today. And I'm hoping to see you all back in a week's time.